Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Before his flight to Earth, they had warned Jonathan about the gangs. Even at the Stamford station where his shuttle had docked, even on the bullet train that spirited him north past brick apartment buildings and houses with gables and turrets, manicured lawns, circular drives, bay windows, even past the shorefront homes of South Norwalk, with sailboats parked on the sand or tethered to metal docks fashioned to look as though they were made out of peeling wood, made to look as though they had been there forever. Past the kayaks and the fountains and the parks populated by poplars and willow trees, they warned him about the gangs. The admonitions were grave and ominous every time they issued from someone's mouth. But the closer he came to the frontier, the grimmer the admonition. Their crimes, their violence, their predilections grew more and more specific. The anecdotes spawning increasingly specific limbs until Jonathan was made to believe that he could discern the very contours of the loosest notori waiting for him in New Haven. People who knew people he knew offered their numbers and their contacts so that once Jonathan arrived, he could pass word of his safe landing. The land was red and burning where he was headed. And if he were not careful, he'd burn too. He had thanked each and every Cassandra, noted that they would heed, that he would heed their advice, but inwardly he was grinning. He was shaking his head and grinning. Among the things they didn't know was the sheer strength of Jonathan's thirst for shadow country. The fact that he had wanted to build something ever since the first dreams of returning to earth had entered his head. That he had spent nearly every waking moment dissecting his plan, putting it back together, testing the foundation and buttresses and the supports, making sure the electricity worked and that the plumbing was done with a strong enough piping and gangs, the invariably white folk who cautioned Jonathan against youthful bravado, against infantile nonchalance, knew that gangs existed, which is to say they knew as much as anybody did about gangs, which is to say they knew nothing. They said gang and he knew they meant black. They said thugs and he knew they meant the N-word. There were a lot of empty factories in New Haven, which is saying nothing, as Jonathan knew there were a lot of empty factories everywhere in America. When he was a child, those relatives still on earth, old enough to be dug in at the roots and either too infirm or too set in their ways to make the pilgrimage to the colonies, would send transmission after transmission to regale their grandson, grandnephew, old friend's child of places like the Rust Belt. It sounded to Jonathan like a stylish thing wrapped around the waist of a skinny guy with dark and mysterious inclinations, an aura of enticing hurt, the kind of guy Jonathan would want to fix by fucking. Jonathan's bees sprouted from his hair, buzzed around his head recording the landscape's deterioration. The images beamed as soon as they were taken to David's clouds back on the colony a little delayed due to spotty connection. Stories of the radiation had made their way to the colonies and even still with the documentation, with the filtered photos on everyone's grams and with the news updates and with the video taken by people on their way out, the whole thing had acquired an air of myth. It had always been something that had happened to someone else. The truth was that Jonathan knew no one still on earth knew no one who had stayed or had been forced to stay, and he saw it as a deficiency. Life was truly lived here, where it was at stake. The forests were bright green, and as he approached the terminus of the train line, bright red, a vibrancy nowhere to be found in space, where everything was a different shade of gray, where every panel and every pathway was drained of color and only the bricks that had came imported from earth seemed to bear any trace of having a full and exacting life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sadiq, that was amazing. Um, 
you can put applause in the chat. Um, let's introduce the uh, man of the hour, Tochi Onyebuchi. Uh, this is his, he is the author of the young adult novel, Beast, of, Beast Made of Night, which won the Mbui Nomo Award for best speculative fiction novel by an African, its sequel, Crown of Thunder and War Girls. His novella, Riot Baby, a finalist for Hugo Nebula Locus, Ignite, and NAACP Image Awards, won the New England Book Award for Fiction, the World Fantasy Award, and an Alex Award. He holds a BA from Yale, an MFA in screenwriting from the Tisch School of the Arts, a master's degree in economic law from Sciences Po, and a JD from Columbia Law School. His fiction has appeared in Panverse 3, Asimov Science Fiction, Obsidian, Omania, Uncanny, and Lightspeed. His fiction has appeared, his nonfiction has appeared on Tor.com and in Nowhere, the Oxford University Press blog, and the Harvard Journal of African American Policy, among other places. And he is joined in conversation tonight by Ken Liu. You, an American author of speculative fiction, he has won the Nebula, Hugo, and World Fantasy Awards, as well as top genre honors in Japan, Spain, and France, among other countries. Um, we're going to put links for both uh, authors' books in the chat, and uh, welcome to you both. Thank you for having us. Oh, wow. Yeah, thank you. Wow, Toshi. Um, <laughs> good to see you again. <laughs> Likewise, likewise. No, I feel really lucky. I, I mean, especially because, you know, Veil Throne recently came out and I know how hard you've been working on that and Dandelion Dynasty in general and just the pace at which we've both been working and the, the amount of time we've spent in the coal mine, so to speak. It's so wonderful to be able to come up for air and to chat with you. Oh, thank you, Tochi. And congrats. Uh, this is an amazing book. Uh, and um uh, you know, before we get started, I just want to gush a little bit about it. Um, Sadiq's reading just brought back all my memories of how wonderful this this book is. Um, you know, it's sometimes a little upsetting for me to read your stuff because it's it's just so freaking good. It's it really just makes me Stop. feel like I'm not doing it. <laughs> I, okay, there there are a couple specific things I want to bring up for, for, for us to talk about. I mean, you know, one of the things I really just love about your work is how evocative it is of the deep history of all of us as a species, um, as a people, as, as the descendants of oppressors and also victims. Um, just, just you know, in that short excerpt, which Sadiq just read with such beauty and passion and amazing, just amazing, amazing performance. I, I love the fact that you've layered in so many illusions. You know, it feels like you're walking through ghosts just reading through that. You've got references to the Roman images of Lucis Naturae, you've got the references to the Bible, you've got the references to the American frontier, you've got the references to uh, a kind of retrofuturism, the way we imagine what the future will be, you've got the urban decay, you've got the very real struggle for the soul of America that we're still going through right now. Um, you've got all of that layered right in there, uh, and it's all done with, with such beauty. Um, I mean, how do you do it? I mean, do you do you actually see this as you write it, or do you just like? I mean, how how do you do it? That's what I want to know. Oh my good! I mean, a good magician never reveals his tricks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I I think I think part of it is that as a reader, I'm a very big fan of dense works and very elusive mm -hmm. works. Um, I don't even know if I can say it's one of my favorite novels, but it's one of the novels that's left the biggest impression on me, Dahlgren by Samuel Delaney. Um, yeah. It's probably the, the first book that I'd read, and I'd read quite a few up until that point. That literally broke my brain. Like I literally, I didn't know what was going on, but I was compelled to read nonetheless. And there was so much that, it was one of those books that felt like I was reading a book full of hyperlinks. And, 
it's like you could you could click on any particular sentence or word or phrase and it would lead you down a rabbit hole of meaning um similarly with under the volcano by malcolm lowry which was another sort of stylistic touchstone for me writing goliath um i like i like references and i like shorthand and it's funny this is this may sound like a digression but one of my favorite things is um eavesdropping on very specific and you see this a lot on twitter on very specific uh conversations happening in very niche like subcultures mm -hmm. where especially if there if it's if it's filled with you know elements of a language that i don't quite understand or that i don't speak um there's a i get a sense of fullness from that and like i don't know if that if that makes any sense but like it's also the thing that I love in very jargony stories and jargony movies, like, I don't know, like Margin Call or even parts of Succession, where there, there's all this, there are these acronyms and there are these phrases and all that. And it, it's sort of like the iceberg theory of storytelling, where there's the part that you see, but then there's this incredible mass underneath the water that you just have to assume is there propping up the part that you can see. And so I think seeing that or replicating that in my writing is a way for me to basically write what I want to read. Um, I'm influenced by so much and, and Goliath in many ways represents for me, a sort of apex of my skill as a storyteller, like everything that I learned as a writer leading up to it went into this book. Um, yeah, I can and, feel it. Yeah. I can feel it. Yeah. So that opening is kind of emblematic of a lot of what I was aiming for and going through writing this book. I think what's really interesting to me also is the way this book, the way your prose is so dense and so layered and so elusive. It reminds me a little bit of, of the, the feeling of being unmoored that a lot of us feel in modernity, which is that because the culture around us is such a palimpsest of, of mm -hmm. layers of cultures, of, of histories that we are not fully aware um, there's a sense that we're always kind of lost, you know, uh, Jonathan has this experience as he steps into the past, you know, um, there's later on this wonderful passage where he's going through and, and, and seeing the abandoned houses, if you will, of, of the neighborhood and sort of trying to figure out what the stories were and not really knowing what the stories were of, of all the layers down there. And I'm reminded of how a lot of us feel that way. I mean, uh, you know, I just recite an anecdote and, and this is actually um, quite interesting. Um, one of my cousins uh, uh, who is a little bit younger than me, uh, there was one time where I was listening to him trying to explain to a friend what a Valkyrie was. Uh, and instead of referring to Wagner or mythology or anything, um, he said, oh, these are vehicles in StarCraft. They come in and, and they do this and that. And I was like, so for him, that literally what is what a Valkyrie was. And, you know, it, I was reminded of that because I saw your title. And I, I got to be honest, the, the first, the moment I saw it, all I could hear in my head was, in StarCraft, when they say Goliath online, <laughs> which is very it's amazing, a very moment. And I was like, oh, in some ways, we're all so unmoored from our culture. We, we have so many layers. It sometimes feels like it's just too much. Um, and you capture that so well with your work. Um, there is this sense of being lost in modernity, of being lost in history, of being. Um, lost in a new frontier that, that isn't actually empty but is just so layered and, and so lost uh that that we are now disconnected from it um i i love that um it it, it is a really beautiful way for you to evoke uh that experience of alienation in modernity um anyway i thought that was just an amazing piece of work oh thank you yeah no it's it's funny when you when you speak about modernity, I'm reminded I, I, a number of years ago, I was able to talk with um, uh, Mohsin Hamid, who at the time he had just written um, or just published Exit West. And we were talking, and this was around the time, this was very early on in 45's administration. And so this was at the point where he was like, you know, 
firing, you know, heads of executive agencies, and there were talks of a, of a coup, and, you know, is the judiciary going to be impartial, and all, all this other stuff. Basically, it was, I think, some of the very first rumblings of what will become four years of questioning the integrity of democratic institutions, um, and all of that. And uh, we were talking uh, about you know, that situation and also the situation historically that he's sort of witnessed and experienced in Pakistan. Um, and I, and <laughs> it was funny too, because I joked with him that some of my, some of my Egyptian friends, Egyptian American friends said, talked about the FBI is like the American Muka Bharat. <laughs> um, and that I think drew out this idea that a lot of it, it sounds very, anodyne to say it this way, but a lot of places are becoming like a lot of other places. Um, <laughs> and so it like, you could see, you know, as we were talking, you could see so many of these sort of like parallel dynamics happening in political spheres in the United States and in, in Pakistan, where you had this chief executive that was surrounding himself with generals. And like all my friends who's, whose parents immigrated from the developing world were like, oh, I wonder where I've seen that before. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's interesting seeing that as a, a sort of manifestation of the dynamic of a flattening of the world in modernity. Um, we're seeing so, it's like, it's, it's, I don't know, everywhere is different, but the same at the same time. Yeah. I, I, I like the way you put that. I mean, I feel like it's not so much a flattening of the world as it is a fractioning of the world. Mm. Um, you know, one of the things about Goliath that I, I, I really love is the way Jonathan approaches America as essentially uh, the way tourists approach places. You know, it's not the way we Americans like to think about our own country. But the problem with that is the America we think we know is not does not represent in any shape, form the the full range of of both depravity and, and, and glory that America actually has. America is not one nation, but a collection of many, many, many nations and many factions and many fractions and many fragments. And uh, I, I love the way your work brings that to the forefront by forcing us to go on this journey with Jonathan to sort of rediscover you know, our own country uh, in a way. Um, the, the thing I also really like about uh, Clive is how how subtle and how just it leads it leads the reader in without really explaining things and then it forces the reader to discover all the stuff for themselves um if you could i i wonder if you can just sort of talk a little bit about who or what is the goliath of the title here oh man well I mean, one of the things that I wanted to do with this book was sort of confuse the interpretation. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted, you know, not to say that there are red herrings or what have you, but, you know, I, I wrote it in part with the understanding that different people from different backgrounds were going to read this book and come away with different interpretations. Um, I mean, I will speak to some of the origin of the book. I, I first wrote the short story that would turn into Goliath uh, in the summer of 2013. And at the time, I was actually in the West Bank. I was in Ramallah. I was working with a, a prisoner's rights organization. And so, uh, and I'd grown up in a very biblically robust household. Uh, and so the, you know, the stories of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, were, you know, from a very early age, part of my DNA. And so all of a sudden, I find myself in this place where all these places that I'd heard about and had imbued with a particular meaning, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Nazareth, they were all places that I went to, that I could walk through, that I could breathe the air of. I could see the people that were living there now. And it was really, really, really fascinating. And then another thing connected to that was that um, the, the Arabic pronunciation for Palestine is Philistine. And so I don't know that I had made that connection before, but immediately I'm thinking of the story of, of David and Goliath and wondering, oh, you know, what was it like for the Philistines before they started beefing with the Israelites? Mm. Um, and that sort of spun into this question of like, uh, you know, again, it's a very biblically inspired 
narrative, but one of the questions that I wanted to ask, especially in the context of climate apocalypse, so to speak, uh, was, you know, given that, you know, your world may have various sort of Old Testament aesthetics, uh, you know, plague and, you know, climate collapse and your rivers are turning to blood and frogs are falling from the sky and bushes are spontaneously combusting and et cetera, et cetera. Um, what does it mean in the context of that to try to live a New Testament life? Um, and so that that is to say, a life that is very much infused with, say, for instance, the principles that are espoused in the Pauline epistles, for instance. Um, you know, what is it like to live a life that is infused with the sort of personal absorption of something like gospel in the midst of apocalypse, right? Um, and I don't know, people People who read my work will, will probably understand that I, I don't really, as much as I love anime, I don't necessarily traffic in the notion of individual villains or like individual antagonists. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's systems. Um, with Riot Baby, the antagonist was the system, um, capital S. Uh, and similarly with, with Goliath, you know, the, the antagonist, if they're, if there can be said to be one is like, it's an idea, you know, it's, it's the idea of, of resource allocation. Um, and I guess you could say resource like disallocation. Um, but I think part of it too is Goliath is in many ways a story of the places where individual people can go to locate hope. Um, mm -hmm. And for each of them too, there is, you know, contrasted with that, their own individual Goliath that they are combating. Um, and some of those Goliaths may overlap, um, but, you know, it's it's almost like dystopia is, is relatively easy to imagine. There can be a sort of copy and paste, you know, uh, aspect to it. You know, it's just a matter of you know who's the you know who's 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 the bad guy wearing the jackboots, right? Um, but utopia is always much more, or tends to be much more specific in the imagining. It, it's almost as though utopia, whenever imagined, is responding to a specific primordial wounding, um, whether that's along the vector of gender or along the vector of race or along you know some some particular injury that the imagining of the utopia is meant to address or redress. Um, and so I, I don't know, that's a very convoluted answer or a convoluted so that's the way only of saying answer you can give. That's what I exactly. wanted you to get at. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. Gol Goliath is what you think it is, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, while on that topic, I also wanted to just say that, you know, uh, one of the things I really loved about reading Goliath is how how fun it is. I mean, you know, I don't want to give you the impression that because it's so rich and layered and dense that you have to go in there with the idea that you're you're there to to follow footnotes. It, it's not. It, no, that's not the point. The point is there's actually, you know, a lot of joy, a lot of fun in it. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm primarily thinking of just of how much fun obviously you had writing it because I love some of those passages, you know, the, the whole word play with pork, you know, pork chop, pork cupine. <laughs> uh, there's some really wonderful moments uh, where you do the word play and, and it's just so fun. So what is, what does joy mean to you and why do you put so much joy into the work? You know, what, what is it about that, you know, in a book about such serious and thoughtful and thought provoking topics. It's, it's interesting because, and I'm glad you bring this out, as taxing emotionally as Goliath was to write, it's also my funniest book. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I laughed a lot while writing this book. And in many ways, it was a relief because, you know, Riot Baby was very much founded on this idea of constriction, of claustrophobia. Um, and it's a book that, like, starts at a very particular emotional pitch and just, like, goes more, goes higher into that. Um, and by design, it didn't necessarily allow me a lot of space for a diversity of emotional registers. Um, 
I wasn't able to engage in a sort of emotional expansiveness with that book. And, it, you know, mm -hmm. I kind of made it that way. Goliath, I wanted to write something that was more scopic, not just geographically and not just, you know, page count wise, but emotionally. Yeah, there's, there's, there's sadness and there's anger and there are a lot of these things braided together and braided with other things, but also these people are hilarious absolutely mm -hmm. hilarious there was like i won't go into the details but there's a character who weighs into the book that tells this story set in atlanta and i cannot tell you how much fun i had writing that scene <laughs> it was it was so much fun it was so because like i know people like that i've known mm -hmm. people like that who like have these wacky adventures <laughs> and it's like that doesn't that doesn't go away. I think there can sometimes be the tendency when imagining these dark futures to think that that's the totality of our of our emotional tapestry, um, mm -hmm. or that's you know that our entire response is going to be, you know, you know, violence and anger and sadness at what we've lost and all all this other stuff. Um, but we don't. I don't think we're ever going to lose our capacity to, for instance, marvel at a sunset, mm -hmm. even if like the air quality of, you know, affecting that sunset means that it's of a much different color than perhaps is healthy. You know, we're still going to have the capacity to marvel at it. We're still going to have the capacity to laugh, to make each other laugh. Um, and I don't know that just it, it was necessary for the characters um, just to like get through their days, but also it was necessary for me. Um, you know, living in the construction process for this book, you know, it was it was dark, and especially coming right off of right off right off of Riot Baby, and I don't know, I found in these instances of humor, um, even if it's an exchange of of a couple lines, a sort of deliverance. Um, which, you know, I desperately needed at the time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think, I, I mean, Doshi, I really love what you've said here because what you're doing here validates one of my core aesthetic beliefs, which is that to write beautiful books that truly reflect the entirety of the human experience and to truly recenter marginalized experiences, you, you have to focus on joy. You have to focus on the full range of emotional experiences. I think, you know, the, the tendency to talk about suffering, about oppression, about marginalization, about all the issues that we have with various isms is that we can end up writing stories in which suffering becomes its own shackles, right? It's its own form of, of, of servitude. It's, it's very easy to fall into the trap where we recenter the oppressor as the only ones capable of joy, and that those of us who are not uh, would, the, the, our only role is to solicit pity, to, to humanize um, ourselves. Um, and, and, you know, joy and laughter, that's subversive. The, 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 the best way to, to, to act defiantly and to decenter that notion of, of superiority of the oppressor is to mock them and to show that we are capable of joy, of, of the full range of, of what it means to be human. Um, I, I love the, the fact that I can see this in your work over time, how important joy is, how important laughter is, how important um, wordplay and, and, and just the pleasure in, in, in sucking every ounce of joy out of every word. Um, that's beautiful, man. I, I just love how you do it. I mean, it's, it's really so inspiring. Thank you. I mean, it's, you know, it's an, it's an aspect of life that I was very happy. I was able to, to replicate or transfer or demonstrate in a work like Goliath. I mean, you know, I, I sometimes, and, and hopefully this will, you know, you know, aspiring writers will hear this and, and feel like they've been granted permission to not be so like dogmatic about, <laughs> about routine and everything. But I, you know, I'll occasionally catch myself spiraling on TikTok, for instance, right? Yeah. Um, I just like post up on the couch, right in that nap trap, and I'm just scrolling. And all of a sudden, like two hours have gone by, right? 
And normally if there's any other activity that I get sucked in um, and that I don't necessarily approach with a deliberateness that I all of a sudden spend two hours doing, I'm going to feel guilty, right? Because I'm like, oh, that's two hours that I could have spent writing or thinking about writing or taking notes or whatever. But invariably I leave those TikTok spirals with a smile on my face um, because more often than not, it's been two hours of me just seeing really clever and hilarious like anime memes by black tiktokers like it's and it's amazing it's absolutely amazing and it's i don't know there's so much there's so much there there's so much bottled up there and it's in many ways become like my last like safe space on the internet um but i don't know it's it's one of those things that because it's like you know it's when I was when I was growing up, I was the I was the only black kid I knew who like listened to metal and like watched anime and like all this other stuff, right? Um, and sure, there were attendant feelings of of outsiderness, but I loved the things that I loved strongly enough that I didn't really care that other people around me didn't necessarily yeah. share my demographic and and love them the same. But it's been so 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 freaking heartening in this day and age particularly of social media and the way in which the internet has has democratized access to various fandoms to Fair see father, like, Koshi, you're, you're now sounding like one of those facebook promoters oh my yeah, 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 yeah. you're no. saying this and you got something good <laughs> no, I, ex excluding facebook excluding facebook <laughs> um but uh i don't know like all these now i see all these you know all these kids looking up who you know, we're growing up the way that I grew up, who now are like, you know, so vibrantly and aggressively in love with, there was, there was a clip from, it was a clip that I saw on Twitter um, a couple months back at, um, it was of uh, Anime NYC at the Javits. It's a, you know, yearly convention, yeah. bunch of weebs get together. And it was a bunch of, it was a bunch of, of, of black dudes wearing the Akatsuki um, like get ups from Naruto. And they were doing this, this dance, the woo to a pop smoke song that somebody was playing in the background. And it was just this like <laughs> herd of dudes just like, and it was, I was like, these are my people, these are my people. Um, <laughs> And so I think like, it, and it goes to exactly what you're saying, which is like, this too is the human experience. Like, you know, you ask, yeah. sometimes you'll, you know, if you're reading a lot of what gets published in, in American publishing, particularly out of the, the New York establishment, um, you'd think that the, you, you know, you, you'd be forgiven for making the mistake that the entirety of the Black American experience is like suffering and mm -hmm. oppression and, you know, trying to survive in the face of state negligence and like all this, all this stuff, right? Um, but it's this other thing too. It's getting with a herd of your people and dancing to a pop smoke song while cosplaying as Naruto characters like that. Like, all of it. All yeah, of it. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and like, and I have to say too, like turning the tables onto you, that's one of the things that I've appreciated about the expansiveness of the Dandelion Dynasty is mm -hmm. that there's, and like, even in, even in the, well, sometimes, especially in like the, the scenes of domesticity, like it just, there's such an incredible range of it's like it's very sort of war and peace and i remember when i when i read when i first read war and peace i had no idea how humane of a book there was going to be like yeah i thought it was just going to be like battles and court intrigue and all this stuff all this other stuff but there is like you can tell tolstoy like loved people loved people when he wrote that book and you know you see it even more you see it even more vibrantly, I think, with Anna Karenina. And it's something that I see in, in the Dandelion Dynasty is like, there's this, there's a celebration of people. And like, there's so much myth happening and like the making of myth and the happening of myth. And it'd be so easy. It'd be so easy for a writer to get caught up in all of that and all the like exciting parts and lose the humanity of it. And that's one of the things that I love about your books and why I'm really happy that they're as long as they are is because I know that there, <laughs> there's plenty of room for humans to be humans in them. And it's not like two whole pages about like 
you like bread for the sake of world building. That's right. It's like, humans yeah. being humans. I mean, that's the key, right? I mean, you know, my my big fantasy novel is about genocide. You know, it's about the terrible things happening. But in the middle of all that, I stop and I have a cooking competition where people yes! are just having fun, inventing I things. I loved, oh, you know. Can I tell you how much I love that <laughs> set piece? Like, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like, that was so good. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Viewers, when you get to that part, Oh my goodness. <laughs> so anyway, so what I was going to say is the cooking competition is sort of the thing that I'm most proud of that I think people will not, you know, necessarily understand because it's it's something that I'm really proud of in the book. I put it in there because it, it, it is very key to the whole aesthetics of the whole world. What's something that you're really proud of that you put into Goliath that you think people might not get right away and then you want to just talk about a little bit and sort of show off a little bit certainly the the thing that I'm that I'm most proud of is that is that story um that that Kendrick tells that's set in Atlanta while they're while they're building um the barn essentially mm -hmm. uh it was funny because so like I I write in a number of different media and um, doing a, you know, a bit of film and TV stuff now, but I also, I did my MFA in dramatic writing. So screenwriting, stage plays, all that stuff. Um, and so one of the interesting side effects of that is that techniques from one medium have bled into or informed my practice of another medium. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to do with this particular scene, and I didn't even realize I was doing it until like part of the way through, was I wanted to write a montage and not like write a montage, yeah. but I wanted to simulate the feeling of a montage. Yeah. Like, you know, you have the voiceover and you have the, the different scenes happening over a period of time. Um, that to me is like so, so, so freaking cool. And I, I, I hadn't realized that I'd never sort of done that before until I was doing it. And I don't know, I just, I felt so... I was so hyped. I even at one point like got on Twitter and was like talking my shit, even though I wasn't <laughs> telling people like what I was talking about because I was so freaking proud of that scene. Like it's this absolutely hilarious story that I managed to turn into a voiceover over this, over this scene. And it's like, I don't know. I was just really, 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 really proud of that. Um, you but, should be. That is awesome. Yeah. That part is awesome. Oh my god. Oh, just hearing you talk about it, it makes me appreciate it even more. It was awesome. Oh man, God. I loved it. Mm. And it's also it's just like it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where it's it's such this wonderful counterpoint to so much of the emotional devastation that like yeah. has happened before and that occurs after in the book. It's this like it's almost, in, in some ways, it's, there's this sort of thesis statement quality to it as well. Like, this is stuff that we get up to. Like, <laughs> like this is stuff that's happened to us. Like, this is, this is just our lives. It's not about environmental collapse. It's not about, like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, you know, we, we went on this adventure <laughs> to help this friend find this thing. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's ultimately what it's really about. <laughs> exactly. Oh uh, yeah, no, that's like that. That's the that's the part that sticks out to me. Um, cool. Yeah. Now, one last thing before we turn to audience questions. Um, what are you working on now? If there's anything you want to share or can share about, you know, future projects. Certainly. So the thing that I'm working on now, a draft of which is actually <laughs> due next month. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good is, planning. Uh, I, oh my goodness superlative planning i am i am a perfect planner uh in terms of maintaining my own sanity um is a a book set at a new england prep school um and you know it's been it's been pitched as um what's the word i'm looking for uh like secret get out meet secret history um mm. which is or something yeah yeah, which is, you know, which is, you know, not bad, but also I'd say there's a heavy dose of Stanford prison experiment in there. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And, um, <clears throat> exactly. <laughs> and so one of the things that it's made me realize is that it's very much the third book in this thematic trilogy that I've been going on. Um, mm. And, 
you know, it's in, in many ways, it's sort of like a reverse divine comedy. Um, if you imagine yeah. Riot Baby as Paradiso, mm-hmm. Goliath as Purgatorio, right now I am writing Inferno, um, which should give you which an idea. Best. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I can't wait to get out. <laughs> But yeah, so that's that's what I'm working on now. Um, you know, I'm also, you know, we were able to announce recently that that I'm doing a, I'm writing Captain America for Marvel, which is right. just that's... a dream come true. Sam Wilson is Cap. Um, I don't know. And then some, you know, of, you you know the you know the deal. A bunch of stuff that I can't talk about yet. Right, right. That's why I wanted to <laughs> you to talk about the ones you can talk about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, keep him busy trying to stay out of trouble. Oh man, that's, that's so awesome, that's, yeah. dude. Just keep it up. That is, I'm so glad to see it. Um, gosh, uh, to, to see you being able to tell the stories you want to tell, man, there's just nothing better. It's, it's the dream. It's the dream. It really is. It really, really, really is. Absolutely. All right, I think Melanie's going to come back on and uh, help us do some audience questions. So uh, I've got one question from the audience now, and you're you all can keep typing them in. Um, I'll go ahead and it's for both of you. Uh, what was the hardest darling you've ever had to kill? Oh, she go for it. <laughs> so there's, there was a, there was a two scene sequence in Riot Baby. That was some of the, some of the story work that I'd been most proud of in my entire life. And that's including like the stuff in, in Goliath. Um, but Riot Baby was very much designed to be a novella and the questions and issues that this two scene sequence would have opened up, we would not have had the space to explore or, or round out or sort of put a button on. Um, and I, I despaired so hard at seeing it go, but I, I mean, this also speaks to the, the, you know, infinite wisdom of my editor, Roshi Chen. Um, you know, she recognized that like this, this bit would open more doors than we'd be able to close by the end of the story. Um, and so I had to, I had to cut it and I like, I haven't been able to figure out like what other piece of work to put it in. (laughs) So it's just kind of sort of hanging out in the ether. Um, but yo, it was so dope. It was so, oh, it was so dope. It was so, 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 so dope. But like, it had to go. It had to go. It will come back though. It will find some other way that the, the really good stuff will, you know, they, they won't stay away forever. You know, we'll figure it out. We'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Um, I have a, uh, I have an answer, but it may not necessarily be the answer that the person <laughs> asking the question was looking for. Um, which is, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of us are writers here, so I'll just share this little bit of writer craft thing. Um, it turns out that I had to learn a very important lesson, which is sometimes the thing that you feel like you need to cut actually needs to grow for it to fit. Um, so, so what happened to me was uh, when I was writing um, the last book in the Denzel Dynasty, um, I just as I was going through this scene, I added four characters uh, who were just bit players. They they were sort of Dickensian one-dimensional characters. They show up with one trade on one page, and then they weren't going to go do anything. And when I was revising it, I felt like this didn't quite fit. It needed to just go. There was no reason to add these four characters. I just really needed to just lop them off. Um, but it just didn't feel right to me. Something about it didn't feel quite right to me. Uh, And I have a tendency to resist most writing advice. So the kill your darlings thing does not work for me. I'm always like, you don't just lop things up. You have to figure out why it's bothering you. What is the issue? It turns out that sometimes the issue is not so much that it needs to be cut, but rather it's unbalanced. It needs to actually grow and become more balanced so that it fits in better. Um, So, you know, needless to say, about 50,000 words were added to the book to accommodate (laughs) these four characters. And and that is how the Blossom Gang came to be. Uh, They ended up being very important to the book, but they needed to grow. So that's that's my advice. Sometimes you actually have to uh, grow the thing <laughs> that, that you thought you needed to cut uh, for it to fit. So um, 
you know, I wasn't working under the pressure of trying to write a novella, though. So, you know, if I were under that kind of pressure, it might be a different result. So, yeah. Oh, man, but long live the Blossom Gang. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Yes. Um, so both of you have dropped a lot of classical references, classic references to classics tonight. And I'm wondering if for aspiring speculative fiction, science fiction writers, what what is the canon for you? Like, what are the books that you think people should 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 read in order to, to be masters of this genre? Oh my God, Toshi, go for it. <laughs> what a great question. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. Well, it's funny because I think canon is personal. Um, yeah. I, I very much push up against the idea that there's like a, you know, top 10 list or what have you. Um, for people to read um, in part because there are all sorts of sociopolitical like consequences and, and dynamics at play in the designing of that sort of curriculum. Um, I will say favorites for me include, of course, Ken's work, duh. Um, and not just, not just his novels, but like particularly his short stories. Um, like his short work is just like, I mean, there's a reason the Paper Menagerie got the triple crown in speculative fiction. Like, there's a reason for that. There's an absolute reason for that. Um, you know, I love Ted Chang's stories. Um, I think it's it's funny because, like, John Crowley was a very big influence on me very early on. Like, Little Big, I think, is, is such um, a remarkable piece of fiction. It was also a piece of fiction that taught me very early on um, the lie that is like, oh, speculative fiction writers don't care about prose. No, like Little Big has to this day, some of the most gorgeous sentences I've ever read in the entire English language. It's, it's just, in many ways, it's like, it's a peerless work of fiction. Um, and then somebody that I got into actually pretty recently, although he's very much a titan in the field is, um, is Gene Wolfe. And of course, there's that very famous, like, tetralogy of his Book of the New Sun. But like, the fifth head of Cerberus, oh my good, like talk about, talk about a dense work that you need to unpack. And it's just like, I don't know. It's, it's funny because it's one of the most incisive pieces of commentary on post-colonialism that I've ever read, that I've ever, 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 ever read. It's just, it's, it's mind breaking. I love it so, so, so much. Um, and of course, like the work of, of N.K. Jemisin and Neri Okorafor. Um, but like for me, what's interesting is the vast majority of my reading actually happens outside of the genre. Um, mm. I'm a huge Jesmyn Ward fan, huge, huge, huge Jesmyn Ward fan. Um, like, I don't know who's excavating American or like who's excavating the American South like Jesmyn Ward is. Um, it's, it's just absolutely just phenomenal um freshwater by Kweke Amezi what they did in that book is like how 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 sway um a brief history of seven killings by Marlon James is maybe mm -hmm. one of my favorite novels of all time so like I think that's part of it too is everybody's canon is different and informs and and thus like the combination of all those things is what informs their writing i think if you have and this is i mean this has been one of the the criticisms of a lot of mfa programs or at least the stereotype of mfa programs which is that everybody has to read raymond carver and dennis johnson and all these sort of astringent like white male writers from you know the the you know from hemingway onward that are you know that traffic in emotionally constipated protagonists and like all this stuff, right? Um, and that produces, that curriculum produces a very particular style of writing that, you know, you see constantly replicated in a lot of places. But the idea of a personal canon, which is basically my way of just saying, read what you love, read what you want, real, read what you feel compelled to read. Um, like that's the thing I think that will do the most for inspiring your voice or influencing your voice. You know, painters, painters emulate the painters that they want to paint like. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to follow up on what Tochi said, which is the personal canon idea. Um, I'm going to add two addenda to that. Uh, one is um, you should focus on 
reading stuff that gets you excited. That's that's really pretty much it. That's that's that number one. And the second one is make an effort to read books that you think you know what it's about, but you actually haven't read because they will surprise you. So I'll give you some concrete examples um, in terms of just reading what you like. Um, I think it will surprise no one that my theory is that every writer in order to reach their full potential have to actually invent the language they're going to use to tell the stories they want to tell because nobody writes in something called modern standard English. N nobody does. Um, and you have to invent the idiolect that is appropriate to the story you want to tell. And it takes a lifetime to do that invention. And, you know, having followed Tochi's work all this time, one of the things remarkable about him is that I could see him developing his own language with the very first thing I read of his, you know, almost a decade ago now. Um, and you can see him refining that language over time. And that language reflects very much who he is. It's, it's very much him as a lawyer, very much him as an economist, very much him as a linguist, very much him as a writer of scripts, very much him as a consumer of games and anime and media and the classics. It's, it's all of that and then transmuted by his own particular way, his way of experiencing the world, his own understanding of human nature. He has to take all of that in and invent his own language. Um, and all of us have to do the same thing. And the only way to do that is not by imitating and, and, and reading what you think others are crazy, but finding the stuff that gets you excited. If the stuff that gets you excited is anime, then go do more of that. If, if the stuff that gets you excited is games, then do more of that. I'm, I'm a very big believer that you have to actually pursue the things that get you excited to discover your own personal canon so that you can invent your own language. Um, and on the second part of my advice, um, a lot of times books are dismissed by people uh, because there's conventional opinion about what they are. So for example, for the longest time, Little Women was dismissed by many great writers as a sentimental uh, book for girls. Um, so if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to go read it because it will surprise you. I got to read it because I was teaching my girls and I had never read it and it surprised me. Uh, it moved me a great deal. Uh, Dickens is often dismissed as an old fashioned writer who writes one dimensional characters. Well, if you haven't read him, I think you should try to give him a try and, and, and he will surprise you. Uh, I, I've always had a tendency to reject conventional settled opinion on stuff. Um, and oftentimes I think um, if you go and read books that other people dismiss as not worthwhile or outdated or, or whatever, you would discover things in it um, that surprise you because part of the reason why the classics remain classics is because they rejuvenate themselves with every age. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, when we read him, he's nothing like what a contemporary Roman would get out of him. What we get out of him is not the same thing the Romans would get out of him. But because he is so interesting and so had his pulse on the human condition, we get new things out of him. Um, and the same thing with um, somebody like Emily Dickinson. Uh, if, you, if you read the old books, um, there is something deeply interesting that you get out of them. So I would just say, pursue the stuff that you enjoy it and also make sure you don't just dismiss out of hand things that you think you already know uh, because they will surprise you. Abs yo, just to hop on that just very, very, very quickly. Yo, a 2AT, because I thought I knew what Moby Dick was about and then yeah. I read Moby Dick and I was like, yo. You mean, right, right? Oh my God, it's insane. It's an insane it's book. I love it. It's wild. Like that book <laughs> blew me away. I was like, Same oh, here. I get it now. <laughs> oh God. So good. Yeah. 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 It's it's amazing. And also too, like the omnivorous, I think I really love when people can speak to a sort of omnivorous quality with regards to their influences. One of the greatest stories being told right now, I know we're really tight on time, but just very quickly, one of the greatest stories being told right now is Attack on Titan. If you're watching yes. the final season right now, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yo, every single episode this season has been me picking my jaw up off the floor. It is incredible. Absolutely incredible. And then uh, that's, that's all I have to say on that. <laughs> 
Well, uh, Tochi, Ken, and Sadiq, I think you're still here. What an amazing event. Thank you all so much. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, buy the books and um, come visit us again when the world is you know, more open and stuff. And we'd love to have you guys anytime. And we'll see you all again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you Ken, everyone. so much. Thank you, Thank Steve. You. Congrats to you again.